Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Ashraf. Uh, I am the founder of Debug Academy, a Drupal architect and trainer. Um, and today's talk is about intermediate Drupal front-end development. In this talk, we take learnings from you know, many years of teaching Drupal uh, to beginners and advanced um, individuals alike. Um, and uh, we're taking some of the most common issues that I see front-end developers uh, introduce them to projects, you know, some of the most common bugs I see uh, when auditing projects. Uh, so we'll go over some of them today and hopefully you know, make our projects a bit more reliable and make us a bit more comfortable writing uh, our themes or coding our themes. Um, so my name again is Ashraf. Um, I am a Drupal developer. I worked at Acquia as an architect for a few years. I have a bunch of certifications here. You can see all these fancy little badges. These are all Acquia certifications. Um, we do have Acquia certification courses. Um, so if you're looking to become Acquia certified, front-end, back-end, or otherwise, um, reach out. We have our booth right outside of this room. Um, we are Debug Academy. Um, and we also have various courses on becoming a Drupal developer in general. So if you are a maybe non-Drupal developer or project manager, etc., and we do teach you from the beginning to becoming a Drupal developer in our part-time three-month course. Um, we also have shorter courses, um, you know, tailored to different skill sets. So we have a Drupal Architect series for people who are already experienced developers and people who have already uh, implemented a project or two. Um, and we have advanced module classes, uh, object-oriented pro programming classes, certification courses, and more. And of course, a thank you to the sponsors of GovCon. Uh, uh, Debug Academy is local to this area, so we've been sponsoring GovCon for years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm also on the board of Drupal for Gov, so I, I get to see it behind the scenes. Uh, these events are not cheap, and you know it's uh, amazing that we're able to put it on as a free event every year. So uh, I appreciate all the sponsors and their contributions. Um, let's jump into the talk. So we're going to start with render arrays. Again, with the setup here is a bit funny since I can't really see the slides, but um, so render arrays um, are something that we love to hate in Drupal. Um, they're known as the arrays of doom. Um, what they are is essentially PHP arrays that consist of the data that you want to display and information about how it should be displayed. Um, so essentially, um, you know, the, the label, the, the actual content you want to display, and then which twig files should be used to display it. There's a few examples of render arrays here. I'm starting off with a simple one, the markup uh, render array. So this one allows you to put HTML directly in your render array. Underneath that, we have a plain text render element, which renders the contents as plain text. So the difference between the two is if you were to put a paragraph tag in the markup element, it would render as a proper HTML paragraph. If you were to put a paragraph tag in a uh, plain text element, the P tag would render as plain text, um, as in it wouldn't work as HTML. And at the bottom, you see an example of a you know, more intricate render element. Uh, this one has a type of checkbox, and then the checkbox render element has various properties that it's looking for. So in this case, the label and the return value. And what that ends up displaying as is a checkbox. In the bottom right, you can see an example of the output of that render element. Um, so again, with your render arrays, you're looking to uh, provide data that should display and then information on how it should be displayed. So in this case, how it should be displayed is the checkbox. That's what tells Drupal which Twig files to use and such. And then the data that you're actually displaying, and the words I accept and the number one in this case. So why do we use render arrays? Um, well, one of the benefits is uh, instead of writing the HTML up front, we are, again, separating the data from the information about how it should be displayed. 
and that gives opportunities to modules and themes to alter the um, display side of things. So, for example, if you have, again, the fact that you want the words I accept and the number one to be um, rendered uh, in a checkbox, you might, you might find that there is some React component out there on the web and you want to use this fancy checkbox, uh, maybe it's like a toggle on off um, fancy React widget, you want to use that instead of the out-of-the-box checkbox. You're not limited to only CSS when you want to do that uh, because of render ways. So you have the opportunity to change which Twig file is used, to alter you know, which properties are, are sent, uh, and so on and so forth. And you have the ability to do that globally. If you're doing this in a system that doesn't have render arrays or some controller level, as they call it, um, then um, you would have to go find all of the checkboxes and change them. But with something like Drupal, everything that's using render arrays can be changed globally at once just by creating a Twig file with the right file name. Um, render arrays also do more than just the display and the data. They also contain information uh, related to permissions, related to caching, and more. It, it contains all of these pieces um, and passes them to Drupal's rendering layer, which ultimately decides what should display at the end of the day, what caching information should be sent at the end of the day, and so on. So what do render arrays look like? What are they cons can comprise of? There are properties which start with a pound sign, and there are organizing entries which do not. Um, so again, these are PHP arrays. I felt like I was yelling over the crowd in the back. <laughs> Closed door cell. Um, so, <laughs> We have properties uh, whose keys in the array start with the pound sign. These are special values that Drupal is looking for. Um, so for example, with the checkbox example uh, we saw earlier, um, when you create a checkbox render element, the checkbox expects a label, so the words that display next to the checkbox. It also expects a value, so when somebody checks the box, what value is being populated or submitted in the background. So that's why we submitted uh, the value of one and the words I accept. Uh, but both of those values were submitted, if you look back, with keys that had a pound sign. So in a render element, um, anything that has a pound sign is sort of a special value that Drupal's looking for. You can't just write a pound sign and write whatever you want um, if it's not something Drupal's already expecting that will cause an error. Um, there are also organized entries, which would be array keys that do not start with a pound sign. And those ones are just for the developer to keep the array organized. So you can make up whatever word you want as the key. You can put something like top and another key of bottom, and then you can put your render elements nested underneath those elements. Okay. Um, the entire page tends to be generated using render arrays. Um, this is what you see when you put a breakpoint or when you pause your code mid-execution. Uh, right before it renders. So at the outermost level, before the page gets turned into HTML, we see that there is a big render array containing pretty much all the elements that ultimately will turn into uh, or will display on the page. Uh, so you can see the outermost one has a type of HTML, and that's because it maps to html.html.twig. Um, it has a page, page pop, and page bottom. Notice these do not start with pound signs. So these are organizing entries. Um, they, if you were to dig deeper inside of them, they'll have render array elements nested within. Um, and there's various other properties here as well, like attached. Attached uh, will list CSS, uh, JavaScript libraries. Uh, so for example, if your header has a dependency on jQuery, and your footer also has a dependency on jQuery, you would note that in their render arrays, and assuming you're using render arrays for this, you would you would uh, list the dependency on jQuery within the attached render property. And when it comes time for Drupal to turn the overall page into HTML, it will check all of the libraries that are attached, it will basically roll them up and dedupe them. So if the header requires jQuery and the footer requires jQuery, as long as you loaded jQuery through render arrays or through Drupal best practices, um, Drupal will recognize um, 
These both need the same thing, I'm only going to load it once. So you also get some performance benefits from using render arrays. Um, now if you create your own render array or if you're using render arrays, there are different types of render elements. Again, there's markup for HTML, if you're putting raw HTML. It's sort of level one of render arrays. When people need to use render arrays, sometimes they'll just write some HTML in there. Um, there's plain text, which sanitizes the HTML. So if your content is coming from an untrusted source, or if it's coming from like a comment in you know, your comment section, um, you don't want to render that as HTML. You might not trust the input, so you can use plain text. Uh, and then the type property, that'll correspond to various types that come with Drupal core. Checkbox, checkboxes, text box, text area, uh, detail elements. There's many, many of these, and um, the Drupal documentation lists them with examples, one example per type. Uh, oops. And then if you wanted to create your own, you could use hook theme to define a new type of render element. And in the theme, um, you'll basically choose a name for this render element. And that will, and you choose which twig file it corresponds to, and you choose which properties it looks for. So those properties uh, we saw with the checkbox, like the label and the return value. Um, in hook theme, you could define your own render element, uh, like slider, and you can say my slider is looking for a label and a minimum and a maximum value. And by defining those within hook theme, you are enabling yourself, your know, modules, themes, to create render elements with a theme property corresponding to the ID you just created and passing in the label and the min and the max that you also define in your hook theme. So if you want to create your own render elements, you do that through hook theme. If you want to see a list of all the render elements, you can see that on the Drupal documentation. There's a URL here. Um, this video will be posted to drupal.tv, which is uh, a web free website that has videos from all the Drupal conferences. Okay. So that's the render elements, render array overview. Um, you, you, a lot of times you can get away without using render arrays very much. The, the time that you sometimes can't avoid render arrays might be if you're trying to alter a form, because forms tend to be built as render arrays first. Um, so for example, if you wanted to change the node edit form and um, turn the title field into a drop-down field to force your editors to pick from a few you know, predefined titles, um, you could use hook form alter, and you would see the form available as a render array. Um, so then you can go into the title property there, and you can change it from type text field to type select list. Um, you would look at the documentation to see which properties select list is looking for, but you can do that sort of thing through render arrays. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Twig in Drupal. Um, so when, when we're building our theme out, um, one of the things we you know, do out of the box is we add our fields to our content type, and then we go to Manage Display, and we'll see the fields in order, right? We can rearrange them, we can hide them. Um, but we're, we're, we're somewhat limited in what we can do through the Manage Display page. Um, now, what we, again, one, one of the things we can do on Manage Display is we can uh, configure the output of each field. So for example, if it's an image field, we can choose, should this image display as a thumbnail, should it display as you know, a responsive image, or should it just display as a URL to the image? So on Manage Display, you can configure how each field should output. And you can see the outcome of doing that right away just by looking at the content. But um, it only lets you put them in order, or if you're using the Layout Builder, it lets you move them around within the confines of the Layout Builder sections. Um, if you wanted to have more control over the output you could override the twig file. So node.html.twig, for example, if it's the content type display, if it's media, it would be media.html.twig. 
and there are more specific file names if you only want to overwrite it for a specific content type. Um, now, for any one of these entity type file names, entity view modes, like node, media, block, taxonomy, all of these entity um, twig files, they actually correspond to the manage display page that I was just talking about. Um, and what I mean by that is, when you go to manage display and you choose which fields to display, you're choosing which fields will be rendered from within node.html.twig, specifically from the, the variable name content in that file. So node.html.twig, block, media, etc., they all have a content variable. And the content variable, and this is, you know, this is, this is a, a big deal. So if you want one takeaway from today, if you've been doing media for a while, um, try to focus on this part. Um, so all the entity display files have a variable named content. The variable named content is controlled by the managed display page. Whatever fields you make visible, whatever settings you apply to those fields, ends up mapping to that content variable. Now, the reason it's important to know this is you can then write content dot and the machine name of any one of those fields. And that will, in your Twig file, that will display the field as configured on managed display. So if I went and I said the image field should display as a URL, I could go to node.html.twig and I could write content.fieldimage and that would print the URL out. And with that knowledge, I could basically rewrite the whole node.html.twig file and I could write my own HTML and I could print out all the fields in my own custom format um, as shown here. So maybe the field heading is inside of H2 and the body is not and you know, I could write whatever custom HTML I want around all of these. There's also this dot zero property that you could append to any of the machine names for those fields. So I could do content.body.zero, I could do content.fieldheading.zero. Um, and what that does is it strips out any of the wrapper HTML and it only renders the value. So it still renders the value as it was configured on managed display, but it will not render anything extra. So for example, if it's the field image field, and I said I want this to display as the URL. One reason I might do that is because I want to write my own HTML that says div style equals background image, and I want to put the URL for that div directly in the HTML. Um, now, if I do that, and I write content.field image, and I go to manage display and configure it to display the URL, the problem is it would not only output the URL, it would output div tags around, it would say div class equals field image. So that's when I would add dot zero. That would strip out the extra wrapper and enable me to use the content dot field image dot zero directly to get that URL for the style uh, settings for the background image. So you can basically take full control over the HTML um, between managed display and the entity display to a file, you have full control to write whatever you like. Now in our Twig files, we sometimes want to know what variables are available. Um, there is a function named dump, which will print out the values of a variable. Um, there is also a filter named keys. So if you write pipe keys, that will extract the array's keys from the variable preceding the filter. Um, so people will combine these. They'll dump a variable and then type keys. We were just talking about the content variable. And I said you could do content.fieldImage, content.body. Um, if you don't know what the machine names are and you don't want to go to the UI and check, you could always do content type keys and you could dump that value and it will print out all of the keys from that array. Um, the formatting will tend to be a bit you know, cluttered, it'll collapse them, and the HTML pre-tag, which stands for pre-formatted, makes this a lot easier to digest. Pre-formatted basically 
tells your browser not to suppress the spacing. So if there are a bunch of spaces, normally your browser would collapse those. Um, so this makes sure it doesn't. So if you use the dump command and you put the pre tag around it, then your array that gets dumped out will be indented nicely and easier to comprehend. And a more valuable piece of information about Twig files is there's a variable named underscore context. The underscore context variable is sort of a magic twig variable. It's not a Drupal thing, it's a twig thing. Um, but it's a magic twig variable that, that points to all of the other variables that exist in the current twig file. So for example, we said there's a variable named content. Therefore, there's a property, context.content. So if you ever want to find out what variables exist in my twig file, all you have to do is put this line exactly as it's written. You put the pre-tag, dump, underscore context, pipe keys. And what that will output is a list of all of the variables that exist in your twig file. Um, so if you don't want to you know, set up xdebug and put a breakpoint in your twig file, this is you know, a valid way to go and find what are all the variables in that twig file. I use it all the time. Um, and one last, oops, one last comment on that. The dump function only works if you enable twig debug mode. So you can do that either through services.yaml um, or nowadays in Drupal 10. You can go to configuration, developer, development, and then developer settings. And you can check the box twig, twig debug mode and that dump function will start to work. Now, one of the most common mistakes I see when I audit Drupal projects, um, you know, people will often bring me in and, and basically say, hey, we have this big team, they worked on this project for two years, and we just have a bunch of random bugs, like this block won't refresh, et cetera. That, that gets stale, and it's usually a bunch of random caching issues. Um, what often happens is the team might have done something like a component library, like um, Pattern Lab or something like that, um, and they wrote their twig files over there, and then they pass in the values by using content.fieldImage, they pass it in, and then for some reason, caching is not working, or textual links are not working, um, and what often happens is, in these twig files, especially in the entity twig files, like node, media, and so on, they have certain variables that have important information that the developers often fail to render. So you can see here what you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have a wrapper element. That could be pretty much anything. It could be a div tag, an article tag, whatever you like. That wrapper element should have the attributes variable printed in its opening tag. The attributes, the variable might contain IP attributes, class attributes, miscellaneous data attributes, and more. And then inside of it, ideally before and after the title variable, if there is a title, you should have title prefix and title suffix. These are you know, more variables that Drupal gives you. Um, you should render those. And finally, the content variable that we've been talking about also should be rendered you know, ideally inside of the div, but at a minimum somewhere in the file. It should be right here. Um, so if you're not doing, if you don't have these four variables in your entity template files, you probably have bugs. It might be bugs that you don't know about, but you probably have maybe caching issues or other issues. Um, for example, using the layout builder, you have drag and drop ability in the layout builder. Um, there's a project where certain blocks couldn't be drag and dropped. And it was because the attributes variable was not rendered in those twig files. Um, also, if you use quick edit on your site, where you can use contextual links and press quick edit, and you want to edit fields in line right there, uh, if you do not render the attributes variable, you can't do that. Um, and also, for any fields you render with the dot zero, quick edit will not work for those fields as well, because the wrapper, the HTML wrapper, is what Drupal looks for to determine where to insert the quick edit. So 
people will sometimes say, oh, okay, I'm always going to put the dot zero just so I have less markup on my page. Um, just be aware that if you put the dot zero, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but just be aware. You, you are making it impossible for modules to you know, do anything with your fields wrapper, including quick edit. So I said we need to render content, and what I meant by that was it's not enough to do content.fieldImage, content.body, and call it a day. You also need to render content itself. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that is we saw the render arrays earlier, right? The render arrays had the miscellaneous properties like type checkbox, label, I accept, return value one. But in the zoomed out render array, we also saw attachments, which had the CSS and JavaScript and such. So the content variable doesn't only have field values, it also has attachments and it has caching information. So if you only render the fields, you're not rendering potentially some of the styling and you're definitely not rendering the caching information. So to do that, if, if you're using the approach we discussed where you're rendering field by field, and you also want to not break your file, um, you should render content, and you can use the without filter, so content without body, content without field image, um, just to prevent yourself from accidentally rendering the body and field image twice. Right? Because when you render content, you're rendering everything inside of content. So if you are manually rendering field image and body elsewhere in the file, then you should also render content without field image and body somewhere in the file to make sure you don't lose the caching information and the libraries and so on and so forth. In some instances, you might have a lot of fields. Let's say maybe you have 20 fields, and you might not want to write content without 20 fields. Um, first of all, it's totally fine. To, to write it without 20 fields, it's not a problem. But if you don't want to, um, this is, I wouldn't call it best practice, but this is a technique that would work. You can create a variable, and in that variable, you can store content and pass it through the render filter. Um, this will trigger things like the CSS and JavaScript and the cache bubbling and whatnot. It'll trigger all of those things um, without actually displaying anything on the screen. Now, in our, in our Twig files, Twig has support for a lot of different things, including code reuse. Um, there are, there's an include statement which allows you to load code from another Twig file and drop it into your current Twig file. Um, there is and Twig also has something called Twig Blocks, which allows you to essentially name a section of your Twig file. It has nothing to do with Drupal Blocks. It's a separate thing. Um, but in any Twig file, you can put a Twig Block opening tag and a Twig Block closing tag. And you can, again, give a name to a section. So here we have Block Logo, and we're putting it around this logo. We have Block Menu, and putting it around this menu. This in itself won't have any impact. It won't affect anything, it won't affect the HTML, or anything else. So why would you name something? Well, you name it in case you want to use one of the code reuse tools. So I mentioned include for copying code. There's also embed. Embed allows you to do the same thing include does, but it also gives you the power to swap any of the named blocks. So from the previous slide, we saw a Twig file that had a, a section named Logo and another section named Menu. With this approach, we're copying all the code from that file, but we're swapping the menu portion of that code. So it's just like a surgical swap. Uh, the Logo portion gets inherited unchanged because we didn't explicitly overwrite it. So this gives you the ability to name some of your code and make it more reusable. There's one more option for code reuse named extends. Extends can do the same thing as embed, but it's a little more restricted. It does not let you write additional code outside of whatever you're extending. So extend allows you to inherit code from another file. It also allows you to swap any of those named blocks, but it doesn't allow you to do anything else. You're not allowed to write an extra H1 tag 
on top of the component. You have to only work with whatever you're inheriting and whatever name blocks they define. So it sends, it's there to really just enforce more consistency. Okay, so we'll talk about the, the pattern lab like approaches. Don't get too excited, this isn't that kind of decoupling. This is <laughs> decoupling styling logic from uh, the back end. Um, so on some projects I've worked on with larger teams and maybe some you know, more team members who had less scruple experience, um, we wanted to enable those team members to contribute more quickly. And the way we did that was by uh, separating the styling tasks from the theming from the back end. So in this case, back end might refer to something like site building, like creating a content type, creating fields. Styling refers to writing Twig and SAS. And theming refers to connecting those two together. So overriding node.html.twig and importing the code from the Twig file, importing the fields, or you know, mapping the fields the way we discussed, and you know, potentially using include or embed to do that, to take the styling code and drop it into the node file with the correct values. Um, so this is a common approach to enable teams to work in parallel and to unblock people who are not that experienced in Drupal just yet. Drupal core, as of 10.1, introduced something called single directory components, which streamlines that process somewhat. Um, so it, it, it uh, we'll talk in the next slide a bit more about it, but basically it lets you uh, create what's called a component, which consists of at minimum a YAML file to describe the component, and a Twig file, which is the component's code. Um, it also has support for CSS and JavaScript, and basically each component gets its own folder. So this is somewhat similar to techniques like Pattern Lab, where each component often gets its own folder. Um, but now it's part of Drupal Core. And one of the benefits of using this approach is the include statements are simpler. You can include or embed or extend. Um, and you just write the theme name, a colon, and then the name of the component. So instead of writing the path to the component, you just write the theme it came from or the module it came from, colon, the name of the component. To use this approach, you would create a folder named components inside of your theme. And then in that folder, again, at a minimum, you would create a YAML file and a Twig file. The YAML file describes what's in the Twig file. This is an example of a YAML file um, creating an accordion from the USDL, USWDS component library. Um, in this case, you can see there are props and slots. Props are basically variables in your Twig file. So what variables does this Twig file accept? And it's meant for simple values, things like integers, strings, etc. Slots, on the other hand, you could, these are for those named Twig blocks. So these are essentially placeholders for HTML. So you can give names to those as well. And your components can have dependencies on Drupal libraries. So why would you create something as a component? Um, you would do that, um, again, you have simpler include and embed statements. Uh, but it's also, the future vision here is um, eventually these YAML files are informing Drupal of what the Twig file expects, right? It's expecting these variables, these, this, this block supports HTML, etc. So the idea is, in the future, you could conceivably um, go to manage display and select a component, choose which fields go to which slots and which props. Um, so you could potentially do theming through the UI. We're not there yet, and some contrib modules are toying around with you know, experimenting with that. Um, that's the type of thing that the YAML file is meant to support. And when you're embedding, I mentioned you can override a named block. You can also pass in values for the variables. So you do with, title, and you pass in the label variable to the title variable from the file you inherit. So you can inherit code from another Twig file, pass in a bunch of variables to it, override some of the main sections, um, and you can basically you know, make your Twig code 
a lot more reusable, especially if you have maybe a multi-site, you know, with multiple themes, um, or you're sharing twig code across multiple sites, it enables all that good stuff. Okay. And last but not least, uh, let's talk about caching. Um, so caching in Drupal, since Drupal 8, has been a lot more robust out of the box. Uh, there are three pieces of caching that we generally need to think about. There's, there's more, but there's three that we generally think about. There are cache tags, which essentially are labels or categories for your cache. Um, so for example, if I have a teaser display in my article, that teaser display in my article would have cache tags of article, to say that it's an article, it might have a cache tag of node one, if it is uh, a display of node one. Um, it might have cache tags saying the teaser display. And the reason you have cache tags is anytime any one of those things changes, so if someone were to go change the teaser display on the article content type, Drupal already labeled the cache for the article teaser. Um, so if you update the article display, Drupal will proactively clear the cache for anything labeled article display. So the idea is your cache actually has labels, so it can be cleared only when it needs to be. So rather than time-based cache, you have proactive clearing. Uh, and then we have max age, sorry, we have context first. Context basically says, who can use this cache? For? Who is it valid for? So if you have no context, that actually means this cache applies to all. If you have a cache context of user, then you're saying this cache is only good for this user. So for example, if it's a block that says welcome Bob, you know, welcome username, then when you know when Bob logs in and the block gets cached, that cache is only relevant to that one user. So that block would need to have a cache context of user. Do you want Ideally, you want to avoid the cache context of user because now you're saying this block, maybe this whole page, is only cacheable per user. You want to make cache as shareable as possible and minimize that cache context. But nonetheless, for when you need it, it's there. And finally, we have max age, um, which basically says how long until this cache is no longer useful. So that might be good for something like a copyright year. Okay, so copyright 2024, if I'm caching that block, I might give it a max age of 24 hours. So every day you just double check that the year hasn't changed before rendering that block. And this is done inside of render arrays. So any render array, you can just add a cache key, or pound sign cache, and then underneath that you would add the cache tags, the cache context, the cache max age, any one of them or all of them. And the caching information bubbles, meaning if you have a, an article teaser on the page, and let's say it's in a view, that article teaser has its own cache tags, the cache tags bubble up, and they also apply to the view that it appears on. Those cache tags bubble up, and they also apply to the block containing that view. They bubble up, apply to the region containing the block, and they bubble up and apply to the entire page. So that way, when that article teaser gets updated, not only the teaser's cache gets cleared, but the view that it's on, block that the view is on, the page that that view appears on, they all get their cache proactively here. And one of the, I mentioned one thing earlier that has something to focus on, this is another really useful thing that I don't see very often. Uh, in services.yaml, there's a property, uh, parameters, render, config, debug, and if you turn this property on, if you enable this property, it displays a lot of really helpful caching information in the markup. So we're used to Twig debug mode, which tells you which Twig file things came from. This tells you which cache tags came from each block, and it tells you directly in the markup, and it shows you, you see free bubble, which means these are the cache tags that directly came from this block. Uh, and then they also show post bubble cache context and tags, um, and that shows you, okay, what did you inherit from the blocks underneath you, um, so you should see those cache tags aggregate as you go outer to outer and outer, outer layers. So this is really, really, really useful debugging tool. Uh, perfect, I did not have my laptop on me, so I could not see how many slides there were or anything, but, uh, but yes, good timing. Um, 
I hope that this was useful. I hope you learned something. Um, again, uh, I run Debug Academy. We have a booth right out here. And, you know, feel free to come up and say hello. Uh, I am giving a few more sessions later today, maybe at 11, before lunch. Um, I'm giving a talk on training for you know, your company. So if any of you is working at a company that might be interested in training for your content editors or your developers or otherwise, feel free to come by to that talk. We'll talk about, you know, what, how to decide what training to do, that sort of thing. Um, if you are personally interested in training for yourself, again, we have our Drupal Architect series for people who have you know, built a few sites before, uh, or for people who are experienced developers switching to Drupal. It's, uh, it's only five classes, each class is three hours. All of our classes are live. Um, and it covers a lot of material, with case studies and code samples. Um, we have an advanced module development for hands-on a full day, um, a, a full day of you know hands-on advanced module coding. Um, we also have a back-end class tomorrow from 9 to 12, um, and Aquaman certification courses where it's about four, four three-hour classes once a week to prepare you for the Aquaman certification exams. Um, and we have the part-time three-month course for anyone who's maybe looking for a career change or looking to become a Drupal developer. That one starts in early September. Um, all the classes are online nowadays, and they're all live. Um, unless you're looking for company training, those could potentially be on site. Um, and we do have a QR code if you'd like a code sample, single directory components, and US MBS. Feel free to scan that QR code you put it in your email, we'll send you that code symbol. Um, and like I said, come say hello at the booth or up here, and I hope that this was beneficial and that you learned something new. Thank you.